September 11, 2001, was a day that totally changed not just American history, but world history, especially since this is a European and world class. That's why it is worth talking about in this class. So we're going to go through some of the events and hopefully uh, clear up perhaps some questions you may have about the basics of what happened that day. The main target of the attack were the World Trade Towers that are part, were, were part of the World Trade Center complex in downtown New York City. There are a number of buildings that are part of this complex, but the two towers were the most visible and the most recognizable symbols. Um, a number of different companies have offices, because these are essentially office buildings, but they were remarkable because they were so tall. They were um, architectural feats. Um, construction was completed in 1973, and um, they, were, they were a tourist attraction. You could go and visit a lobby and see a lot of the artwork that was displayed in the buildings. You could go to the top of the towers for a great view. There was a famous restaurant called Windows on the World. Um, and so these were a very well-known site around the world. And as the World Trade Center, they did stand for and, and symbolized capitalism, especially the American influence on capitalism. So it made sense that these were, um, these were targets of extremist terrorism. There were 19 hijackers, all trained in the Al-Qaeda camps we talked about before. And then some of them were adi had additional training in flight schools to be pilots because they were going to hijack planes. Um, some of those flight schools were in San Diego. And after the fact, the instructors were instruct instructors were interviewed and had said that um, the men really, they were never interested in the part in class about landing. And they thought at the time it was weird, and now, looking back, they realize they had no intention of ever landing. In the world that you have grown up in and lived in, uh, security at the airport is just a way of life. Before September 11, 2001, there were a few precautions, but not many. Um, it was pretty easy for anyone to get to, to the various gates and to get through the airport. So these 19 uh, terrorists are able to get through security with pepper spray, with box cutters, and that is how they will take over these planes. There are four different flights, two originating from Boston, one from New York, and one from Washington, D.C. And you can see on this map the exact point at which the hijackers take control of each flight. The reason why they are using these flights, these particular flights, is each of these flights was originating on the East Coast and was going to the West Coast. And so they could then use these planes as flying bombs, because these planes, these flights, would have more fuel than, say, a plane that would be going from Boston to DC or Boston to Montreal. Each plane had est uh, estimated about uh, 10,000 gallons of fuel. The first flight is American Airlines Flight 11. It leaves Boston with 87 crew and passengers and five hijackers. It crashes into the North Tower at 8.46 a.m. between the 93rd and 99th floors. And there are about 110 floors at the World Trade Center. It's estimated that it was going about 440 miles an hour. You can see there in that image that the plane um, is very centered, and that's important uh, in understanding what will happen later on in the day. Not many people had seen the impact. Um, we did see one clip of the actual impact from the, the French documentary brothers who were already following the New York Fire Department and happened to catch the impact um, on their cameras. But many people did not see it, and so at this point, around 8.50, on that Tuesday morning. Many people thought that there had been maybe an electrical problem or some sort of internal explosion that had caused this. 
some people said they thought it was a plane, and so some people thought perhaps it was a commuter plane that just got horrifically off course. At this point, people were saddened, upset, um, but ne not necessarily afraid. It's not until United Flight 175 that uh, departed from Boston as well, with 60 crew and passengers and again five hijackers. When it crashes into the South Tower at 9.03 a.m., it becomes abundantly clear that this was on purpose. There's no way that this accident could repeat itself twice in 15 minutes. This plane was also going uh, about 100 miles faster than the plane that hit the North Tower, and it was uh, lower. It was around the, 70, the 77th floor. Um, as you were able to see in the clips we watched in class, you can see that, that the plane was flying at a, a much steeper angle. It was making a turn as it, um, as, it entered the, as it entered the building. And rather than entering the building straight on, sort of evenly through the building, it was off to the side. So on an angle and off to the side will make a difference to, this, to the story what happens. So again, there you can see the North Tower is hit first higher and more centralized. The south tower is hit second on an angle and to the side of the building. Because the, the news cameras were watching, they, they had their cameras pointed at the World Trade Center, everybody saw the second plane hit. And we could hear from the, the newscaster in the video clip we watched that that moment of realization or the moment of recognition that this was not an accident, that someone was doing this on purpose, and that America was under attack. Now, America had not been attacked really since Pearl Harbor, and even then, America was not officially, or, or, excuse me, Hawaii was not officially part of America. So this really was the first time American soil had been attacked since the 1800s. We thought that perhaps this is where it would end. But then we learned about American Airlines Flight 77. This plane left Washington Dulles with 59 crew and passengers, five hijackers, and it crashed into the Pentagon. Now we don't have um, clear footage of this, and this is one instance where many uh, conspiracy theorists like to say that it was a missile or it was a government conspiracy. What we do have is we have the security footage that comes from the sort of the, the checkpoint, the kiosk, and it's a little bit grainy. It's sort of um, that stop and start image where it's almost a still, a series of still images. And you can see a, a white sort of tube in one, in one uh, frame. And then the next, is, this is what you see. The Pentagon is not a huge building in terms of the height. It's, it's not at all like the World Trade Center. It's only about five stories tall. And so it would have taken uh, a considerable amount of skill as a pilot to be able to hit this target, to be able to get low enough. Um, and it, gets, it does get low enough to the ground that it does take out a number of, of street lights, the street lamps. The Pentagon is an office building, and there are a number of layers to this building. Um, one thing that was fortunate about this, about this explosion, this attack, is um, this part of the building was in the process of sort of moving offices, so it wasn't as occupied as it could have been. At this point, at 9.40 a.m., all flights are grounded. No flight in America is allowed to take off at this point in the morning. And the announcement goes out to all flights that are currently in the air that they need to land immediately. Because at this point, it was obvious that commercial flights had been hijacked, and they didn't know how many. They didn't know what additional targets there might be. And so all commercial flights were forced to land immediately. Next, probably the most famous flight is United 93. It left New York, New Jersey, right outside New York City. Um, there were 40 crew and passengers. It wasn't a very full flight. And this was the plane that landed in rural Pennsylvania. 
So this was the very last plane. You can see there on the diagram when, uh, when the hijackers took control. By this point in the morning, almost, almost um, a full hour had passed since the first plane hit the North Tower. And the pilots and, um, had told the flight attendants, something's going on, there's been some planes that have been hijacked. So when the hijackers take over Flight 93, they get, are able to get into the cockpit and kill the pilots. Um, the flight attendants and the passengers know what they have to do. These passengers didn't know for sure um, what, what their target might have been, but they knew that they were not going to allow this to happen. Probably the most famous passenger is named Todd Beamer. And, um, and passengers started getting out their cell phones and calling their families. And Todd Beamer was talking to his wife, who was pregnant at the time, and was telling her that he loved her and that he probably uh, wouldn't be home that night. And as he's about to hang up, his wife heard him say, let's roll. The evidence that we have from uh, calls that were made by passengers to their loved ones, as well as the flight recorders that were eventually recovered, we know that the passengers on Flight 93 were able to get into the cockpit, probably with one of those really, really heavy drinks carts that you think will take off your arm if it hits you in the aisle. Uh, they got into the cockpit, they were able to overtake the hijackers and put the plane down into a field in Pennsylvania. So here is the flight recorder that was recovered that allowed us to have a better understanding of what took place that morning. And we needed that because this was all that was left of that plane. So in the same way that these radical extreme Islamic terrorists are willing to sacrifice their lives to destroy what America stands for, to destroy capitalism, to destroy freedom. The passengers on Flight 93 were willing to risk their lives to prevent that from happening, to save a potentially much larger death toll. Um, it's believed that this plane was headed either for the Capitol building in DC or even the White House, these political symbols of what America stands for in hitting the Pentagon, they hit the military symbol. And with the World Trade Centers, they hit the economic symbol of America's power and influence around the world. Not, it, it really wasn't clear what would happen after the towers had been hit. Some people felt that it was, it was just so horrific and people were evacuating, but um, you know maybe it would be possible just to extinguish the fire and then try and salvage the building. But it, that became abundantly clear that would not be possible when the South Tower falls. Remember, the South Tower was hit second. That was the one that was hit lower and on an angle. And you can see the result of that here, where the top of the building has sort of fallen over because it was on an angle. It had lost its center of balance. The many of the conspiracy theorists will say that there were explosions. Um, unexplainable explosions, so the government had placed bombs in the planes or in the buildings previously. But what they're not considering is that 10,000 gallons of jet fuel burns at an incredible temperature that not only would be able to melt the steel, um, the steel and concrete structural foundation of this building, but it also was hot enough to destroy all of the fireproofing Another thing that happened here in the South Tower was when that plane hit, the jet fuel then went down the elevator shaft and exploded into the lobby. So after just 56 minutes after collision and of uh, burning, the South Tower falls in a matter of seconds. Uh, the video that we saw in class or that you're on canvas, you can sort of hear the shock because people were still sort of wondering, well, the firemen will get there, we'll evacuate all the people, because remember this is an office building, it's a Tuesday morning, people were at work. Um, as the building falls, it becomes scarily clear that, that there is not going to be much recovery. 
Then the north tower falls, and after 102 minutes, it falls essentially straight down. So by lunchtime on Tuesday, September 11th, it seems that recovery, we can't save the building, so we now need to save the survivors. There were um, New York firefighters and policemen and, and a number of th thousands of office workers who were in the buildings. And so the next job was for the firemen and volunteers to piece, to sort of pick through the rubble and find the survivors. Unfortunately, there were only 11 survivors that were pulled out alive. You have to, you have to consider that this is over 100 stories of an office building, of two office buildings, that there was a massive explosion that weakened the integrity of the building, and then all of that weight compounded on itself again and again and again until the buildings fell. Once they realize that recovery will not be, prop be possible, it becomes about cleanup. So you can see here, not only were there the two main buildings, but when these buildings collapsed, they caused damage to other buildings that were part of the World Trade Center complex. The cleanup process takes you know, a year and a half, nearly. Um, it took an incredible amount of time, not only just to clean it up, but because also, Every time they came across the remains of someone, they paused. Cleanup didn't even begin until May of the following year. It took almost it took over six months to put out the fires and and have control of uh, structural integrity and control of the area to be able to really begin to clean up. The estimated costs for cleaning up just Manhattan um, were about five billion to remove all of the debris, 14 billion for any type of reconstruction, three billion in overtime payments to workers, and one billion dollars to replace the fire department's vehicles. New York City becomes a symbol first of tragedy, but then of American strength and unity. The mayor at the time was Rudy Giuliani, and he, he really becomes that face of the American and the New York spirit. A few weeks later, when Saturday Night Live returns for their, for their season, um, Rudy Giuliani and some members of the New York Fire Department were there, and the executive producer of SNL, Lauren Michaels, asked, you know, is it, a, is it okay for us to be funny? And Giuliani says, well, you've never been before, so why should you start now? And collectively, America laughed. They breathed a sigh of relief. And we started to realize that as, as horrible as this was, we needed to we needed to rebuild. We needed to gain back our sense of strength and our sense of self. This has become an incredibly famous picture. Um, and it really does symbolize that in a tragedy, Americans rally. That the, that the and, and even what we talked about in the Cold War, that while there are some things with democracy and capitalism that aren't always uh, altruistic, America is very unique in its ability to come together in a time of tragedy. Of all of the rubble, this symbol remained intact, that these two giant steel beams stood together in a cross. Now, it could have been a happenstance. It could have been a complete coincidence. But Americans looked to this and said, okay, there, there is hope. In the midst of the tragedy this day, there is hope and we will rebuild. And it was just so strange that this symbol, this, um, this sort of what had dominated the New York skyline in a matter of hours no longer existed. And so like I said at the start, the world forever changed that morning. Not just for America, but also for the rest of the world in understanding what we were up against with this Islamic terrorism. Um, 
some people were just completely shocked and had no idea who had done this. But people who were in the know and people who had been following world events, um, I remember my dad even that morning said, oh, this is completely Al-Qaeda. This is Osama bin Laden. He's been talking about stuff like this for a while. Part of the rebuilding process is to commemorate those who were lost. So there are memorials at the Pentagon. There is one in Pennsylvania. And of course, at the Twin Towers. The first few months after cleanup started, um, these giant beams of light in the place of the Twin Towers um, sort of shone for America, and then for the first few anniversaries as well. Then the process began to figure out a more permanent, a more permanent response. One way this was done, the steel, some of the steel that was recovered from from the um, from Ground Zero, was used in the production of the USS New York, an American ship that goes around the world protecting American interests. Then there were competitions to figure out what to do at actual Ground Zero. So we have the fountains that you probably have seen on the 8th grade adventure, if you've been to New York before, um, standing in the footprint of where the buildings were and the names of all of the victims, all uh, 2,000 or almost 3,000 victims. Their names are inscribed around the fountain. And then we also now have the Freedom Tower. Some people wanted to rebuild uh, the towers exactly as they were. And most people decided that that was probably not a good idea because no longer would those towers be a symbol for American strength and uh, commerce, but they would be forever connected with that morning of tragedy and all of those memories. So the Freedom Tower was finished in uh, 2014, and it stands at 1,776 feet tall. <laughs> 